Today is World Hijab Day. So we must squeeze in between these two speakers. We must squeeze something, even if it is 10, 15 minutes, especially when our sisters are around, to discuss about the hijab, the significance of hijab, and why it still remains the pride of every Muslim woman. Your wife, your sister, your mother, your auntie, your daughter, your niece, whatever it is, any relationship we have with a woman or a girl or a lady, she must, be, she must know the significance of hijab. So 30 minutes for me, 30 minutes for my brother, and then maybe 15 minutes for World Hijab Day today, then we can cap it with questions, observations, inshallah. I don't know how to approach Abu Zarin al Gifari. I'm even more afraid when Mala Idris Usman is still coming. I can see him because there will be three teachers then the teacher and two of his students, inshallah. Inshallah. But typical Damasani Jikoko, I will not be afraid. I will talk, even if it is one page. Uh, yes, yes, I will not be afraid. I, I want to. I want to announce the arrival of my teacher of this topic, inshallah. Whether he likes it or not, I must talk. And you better get a chair for him to come in front. <laughs> no, 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 come, don't, don't. Look at, you have frightened him. <laughs> oh, he has frightened you. <laughs> I will never be comfortable if I'm sitting in the crowd. Yes. Don't leave, please. Please don't leave, please. I don't know what to say again. <laughs> okay, okay. Let me let me do my do you know you know you are nupe, me I'm Hausa. Let me do my bombarama and keep quiet. You can now you can now rectify. I'm not wasting time, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> let me do my digimataz adegu. Uh salamu alaikum warahmatullah. Uh just as I said, over thirty-two years ago, Mala Idris Usman and Sheikh Tajuddin put us through some of the interesting stories in this book, Rijal Hawla Rasul, by Muhammad, an Egyptian historian and scholar. May Allah have mercy on him. Today's personality, I deliberately chose it because two weeks ago, I delivered this same personality in another uh, forum. So at least it is still fresh. Although I am yet to complete it over there, I will just recap what I said here. So I will spend my 15, 20 minutes and hand over to the Mujahid but above all, we have a third speaker now, inshallah. Um, Abu Zarin al Gifari, may Allah be pleased with him. He's a personality not from Makkah, but at the early stage of Islam, a stranger disguised and entered Makkah. If you see him from a distance, you will think. Is either a traveler who has come to refill his gas or to make more provision before he moves. Or you may take him for one of the idolatry worshippers who has come to show his respect to the 360 idols in Makkah and then go back. So he hid himself and disguised himself. But honestly, his ambition or his purpose of entering Makkah was completely different and strange. While in his hometown, Gifar, that's why he's called Gifari, while in his hometown, he detests idol worship, although it was the common thing in the whole of Arabian Peninsula that time. He detested it. He hates it that time. So he was searching for the truth. He was searching for reality. So when he had a merchandise from Makkah, to Syria, to Yemen, to other Arabian Peninsula. One thing is his town is a gate to these places from Mecca. Gifar is like a gate way to the other Arabian Peninsula. So merchants who are moving started saying, there is one man, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that has come with a new religion. He said we should abandon our 360 idols but we should worship one and only one God. So to him, it was a welcome idea, but to others, it was strange and against the norm of the society. As a typical realist, 
He said, let me go and look for this man. He started asking questions. They mentioned the name. They mentioned some characteristics. So that was why he disguised and came to Mecca. In other words, he was a Muslim even before he embraced Islam. Trekked from Gifar to Mecca. Entered, covered, disguised, and pretended. And he was so careful that less than 24 hours, look at him face to face with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He was careful, he profiled, he asked questions, he asked location, he asked, and he was lucky. At the time he met sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was nobody sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alone. So he came face to face, he saw those features that was described. He saw that beauty. He saw that excellence. And uh, he was the one that first spoke. Good morning, my Arab brother. Of course, from the tonation, when a Sokoto man talks to a Kano man, you know that there is a difference. Or when a Kano man talks to a Zao man, you know there is a difference. But the way he spoke, Salem knew that he was not from Makkah. But because he started, good morning. So Salem replied him, Wa alaykum as salam, rahmatullah, wa barakatuhu, my dear brother. That was one. He said, can you sing the song? People say you are singing. Anshadani. Anshadani. Sing the song for me. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, it's not a song. It is the recitation of the Quran. He said, okay, recite it for me. At that time, you know the verses that we are coming down. It was the other part of Islam. So it's ayah, ikra, o ya ayyuhal muzammil, o ya ayyuhal muddathi. The early part. What do you think was the reaction of Abu Dhar? He said, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. Instantly, he accepted Islam. If you are following this book, there is a similar event during Mus'ab bin Umair. When he entered Daru Al-Qam, Ibn Al-Arqam, he met the Prophet in a cycle of his few companions. He sat down, the Prophet was reciting Quran immediately. He was, he was shivering, he was shaking. And instantly he accepted Islam. That is the impact of the Quran on true believers. Not today you are reciting Quran, somebody will be making noise or jesting or laughing. Not today you put a Quran in your radio or in the, in the car and you will be discussing contracts. Not today you will be reciting Quran and no shaking. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله. وتلك الأمثال نبربها للناس لعلهم يتفكروا. The Quran shakes even the mountains and the stones compare and contrast. So he accepted Islam instantly. And when he accepted Islam, the first thing he said, Ya Rasulullah, what do you advise me? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, go back to your town, go back to your village, Remain there until you heard that Islam has flourished because Islam is under threat now. Islam is new. The system is new. The reality is strange. It's no wonder Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, strange is the beginning of Islam and strange it should be the end of Islam. But Bada al Islam Gariban was a Udu Gariban but congratulations to those who are strangers even at the end of the world. May Allah make us among them. So go back to your town, go back to your village, and remain until Islam starts flourishing. But Abu Dhar, well, he agreed with the Prophet, he will go back. But he wants to test his Iman. Just one day Iman, or one day Muslim. And what he did without telling the prophet was to, to Kaaba, where there were 360 idols, and climb one of the stones. Some say it was Safa. You know, even now within the mosque, the Mount of Safa is there. He climbed and shouted, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah 
wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh according to that is the first open proclamation of the shahada so you know what it means it's like when we are fresh or when we are in the university you shout in front of the barrack <laughs> so what do you expect at least you receive some beatings that was what happened abu dhar was beaten beaten and beaten to stupor he fell down there they left him there he managed to wake up or some people revived him some said the, the same day in the evening some said the next day he repeated what he repeated in fact the third time it was women that we are worshiping their idols he just he joked with them say what are you doing and they shouted the nobles of makayem descended on him in fact that second attempt or third attempt they would have killed him but somebody i think it was the uncle of the prophet abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu that came and told them look oh, don't kill this man where he's from gifar and all your merchandise all your products all your trading items must pass through that town if you kill their kinsmen not only your products will be seized you may even lose your lives don't touch this man again that was how abu dhar was mysteriously saved from death but at least he has tested his iman iman has some bitter experience if you claim you are a mu'min and you are not tested just that or unconfirmed then you are not you are not you are yet to be and that is why even the arabs when they say we are believers sallallahu alaihi wasallam say no just say you are muslims because unless you are tested with your iman you cannot call yourself or claim to be a mu'min and that was what happened so by the third day he came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and bid him farewell at least he has tested his iman three times so he moved and that was all scene two was in gifar where he went back did he just go back and lie down did he relax was he waiting for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam until he hears no interestingly i forgot is a very funny side of the story when he embraced islam the next thing the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him where are you from he said ya rasulullah i'm from gifar sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked at him smiled you know sallallahu alaihi wasallam for him to be engrossed in surprise to smile to an extent that his two front teeth short that means it must be very funny so why was the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam shocked why was he surprised because gifar according to my teacher is the home of armed robbers armed robbers is the home of welayas if you allow maghrib to reach you in gifar forget about your product forget about your money forget about your possession in fact be careful with your life so they are notorious for arm robbery night robbery especially it's like you taking a commercial bus or a commercial vehicle to kaduna by 7 pm anything can happen especially around kateri jere and the rest exists until you pass rijana before you are comfortable or it's like you during the about 7 8 years ago you say you, from meduguri you are going to bama or what is the name of that border town uh, what is the name the, at the tents of boko haram that time it's like taking a risk so the same thing with gifar it was known for notorious in fact notoriety of arm robbery so they 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 were known for that so for a man from that notorious town in the early days of islam in fact according to historians he is either number 5 or number 6 in accepting islam so by the time you count nana khadija said na abubakar Imam Ali radiyallahu anhu by the time you count uh, Bilal ibn Rabba and probably people like Mus'ab bin Umair he is number 5 or 6 in the list so you can see is the early part of Islam and yet a notorious person a community one person will come clean to come and accept Islam is a shocker not only a shocker is quite interesting to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so he advised him to go back and when he be- went back he never slept in fact he walked with ya ayyuhal is it muzammil or muddathir 
قم الليل امين قم فانذر وربك فكبر وثيابك فطهر he started da'wa and before you know it gradually home to home street to street land to land before you know it i won't tell you the result when he finished with the whole of gifar his home hometown and they accepted islam he moved to the next neighboring town aslim and they are also continue with the da'wah calling people and before you know it the entire town of gifar and aslim we are muslims it took him over 10 years by the time he heard that sallallahu alaihi wasallam have moved to medina and his people have also moved with him he now say yes it is time to go and see my role model it is time to go and see my master it is time to go and see rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so what did he do he arranged a convoy of all the people of gifar and all the people of aslim in a convoy some on camel some on horses some trekking from gifar up to medina and they entered medina in rows and in social men women old women young women children boys and girls all moved to medina if not for the shouting of allahu akbar allahu akbar la ilaha illallah you will have told that these are enemies who have come to attack sallallahu alaihi wasallam in medina they were trekking and trekking and trekking until they arrived medina immediately they entered medina they turned to the prophet mosque sallallahu alaihi wasallam and here is a long procession under a leader an unassuming leader um abu dharrin al gifari radiyallahu ta'ala anhu sallallahu alaihi wasallam was surprised when abu dharr accepted islam but was more surprised to see how his ambassador did in the last 10 years so he entered medina and reported to his master here we are sir the whole of gifar and the whole of aslim sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked at these two groups he looked at the road i mean he looked at his students and saw the result you know sallallahu alaihi wasallam statement is a stamp both in this world and the hereafter he looked at the people of gifar and say gifar gafar allah lak Gifar, Allah has forgiven you. He turned to the people of Aslim. He said, Aslim, salamakumullah. Allah will continue to descend peace upon you. I wish I was a Gifari. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he turned to the ambassador. He gave Gifar their stamp. He gave Aslim their stamp. What of the ambassador? He made a statement, a historic statement. He said, "Ma akalleti le gabara, wa azilletu le gabara, asdaku la hajatan min abidhar. Ma akalleti le gabara, wa azilletu le gabara." أصدق لحجة من أبي ذر. The earth has never ever carried anybody on its surface. The sky has never shed its shade on any personality more truthful in his tongue than Abu Dhar in Gifar. Wow. This is a statement. And the Prophet had a reason why he said so. And Abdul Razak will carry us along on the reason why the Prophet made this historic statement. Ma akallati la ghabara wa azillati la ghabara asdaqu la hajatan in Abi Dharri. In other words, maybe till the end of the world, Nobody is more truthful in his tongue than Abu Dhar. But then, let us reflect over these things. 
And we are going to pick the lessons of all this story. It's not just the story, but this historic statement by Prophet Muhammad. I deliberately quoted it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The next thing the Prophet asked him was very important, and that is what he will help us digest. He asked him, Abu Dhar, you have done your job as a da'i. But if Allah lived you for so long, by then Islam is flourishing and booties are coming. When the leaders of that time start pilfering from the booties of the treasury, what will you do? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam deliberately asked him that question. What will you do? I don't want to start cutting, cutting the Arabic. I'm just summarizing because I have limited time. What will you do? He said, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, I will carry my sword and chop off their heads. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kept quiet and said, Ya Abu Dhar, can I give you a better advice? He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, okay, don't fight them. Don't fight them. Be patient until you meet me. Be patient until you meet me. This statement is pregnant, and there are many lessons therein. Don't fight them. Be patient until you meet me. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is unique. Be patient until you meet me. What does that tell you? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will go and leave Abu Dhar on earth. What does that tell you? Whatever, however terrible a Muslim leader is, don't fight. Don't fight. Abu Dhar took 75% or 100% of that lesson. He didn't fight, but he never kept quiet. He never stopped saying the truth. He never stopped talking and talking and talking to the same Muslim leaders when Islam was flourishing after the demise of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I told you, I will just give this little portion. I will leave Abdul Razak Ani Mashaun to continue with the struggle of Abu Dhar with the leaders of Islam after the demise of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I will say this, and 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 I will say this. For the brief uh, introduction to the topic, Abu Zal Al Gifari, we are going to continue with uh, Ashik Abdrazak and Masha Inshallah. Tafadali Ashik. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Now, may Allah bless Madam Idris. If there's one thing we learn from Madam Idris, it is humility. If there's one thing we will learn from Madam Idris that is who just spoke now, it is humility. Now, may that increase him in wisdom. I also want to greet my my Amir, my one or two Amir, Amir Idris, this man, my beloved brother. Madam, show mercy on you, sir. And I also want to greet the our current Amir. May that guide you and assist you, sir. And all the good brothers around. Um, Abu Dhar is an institution. There are 100 Muajirun in Mecca. 13 years of the of the Rasul produced just 100 Muajirun. And those Muajirun, they live so many years after the demise of the Rasul. Mm -hmm. so, so, um, when you look at it, the way Allah picked them up, picked them up, they, were, they had the same sifat, characteristic. They were young people, they were poor people, and they were weak people. Most of them, there are individuals that are very rich, but they are very, very few. But the bulk of them, they were young, they are weak. Weakness in Mecca, if you are weak, you cannot speak. Nobody will listen to you. 
These are the people Allah gathered for Rasulullah. Abu Dhar is one of them. Now, and um, the issue of him being an institution. When they went to Medina, and Rasulullah died, they were scattered across Hijaz. They were scattered. They were scattered all over the Muslim Empire. When people hear that a Muajirun or any Sahaba is, leading, is living somewhere, that place becomes like a Mecca. There's a track of everybody going to see the companion. You know? So the same thing happened to Abu Dhar al Gifari. Let me discuss number one. I have about eight, seven points here. I will discuss his interaction with Muawiyah. He deliberately he went against Muawiyah. Oh. Yes, Muawiyah. He was with Uthman when the crisis came. And an important habit of Abu Dhar, his tongue is very sharp. Oh. Has a very sharp tongue. They cannot see truth and keep quiet. They must talk. And you know the way he speaks, I'm sorry. Look at Madame Idris, when he's speaking, all his body is in his speech. Even if you don't believe in it, you have to listen to him. And he does not lie, that is Abu Dhabi Gifari. So when you speak, you speak violently, not violently, but passionately. So you are forced to listen to him. Not just him, you are listening to a Sahaba. Like Imam, like Imam you said, number five person to come to Islam. Number five person to be a Muslim. Now, so with Muawiyah, when Muawiyah came as the Amir in Syria, they called Syria then Sham. Sham includes four or five countries now. It includes Lebanon, Lebanon, includes Jordan, Jordan, includes Palestine, Palestine includes Syria and southern Turkey. Those are the part of Sham that Ali Muawiyah, I mean, was ruling over with a lot of wealth. A lot of wealth. Now Abu Zar is not a poor person, but he rejected wealth. Not that he's a poor person. He, he completely rejected wealth in the midst of wealth. So when he saw the wealth that one we are is playing with, he raised up his voice. Now he raised up his voice, he went against, and when he's speaking, People come to listen to him. They surround him. They listen to the ears of the people. Well, we are to write a letter to Uthman. This man is a Rabu Rosa. It will cause me problem. So Uthman now invited him to Medina to stay with him. Now, during time of Uthman, there were geometrical expansion of Muslim empire. So those who came to Ifriqiya, Amun Sahabas, they came back to Medina with a huge wealth. So Uthman gave someone 500,000 dirhams. Yes. He gave another one 100 thousand dirhams. Ha! This is too much for Abu Gifar. Abu Gifar is too much for him. He became to speak against what Uthman is doing. Yes, Uthman is the fourth caliph. He's not third caliph. But this is Abu Dhar is speaking. He couldn't just say, you know, keep quiet to him. And uh, so with wisdom, Uthman also asked him to leave Medina. It will become a fitna for them. So he was sent to 
at Damascus. That's Damascus. Now, let me. Now I have here too the story of uh, Abu Dhar that is in Tabuk. Tabuk was a major military battle of the Rasul. Major. I said major because it's a Gazwa, not a Saria. A Saria is when Rasulullah asks people to go and fight. But when he himself had to go, it becomes a Gazwa. So Tabuk is a Gazwa. From Medina to southern Syria, where Tabuk is, it is a month journey. It is a month journey. The Battle of Tabuk, it was done when the Muslim suffered drought. So things were difficult, the preparation. So they were going on the journey, and um, as they were going, also someone asked, what about this person? They said, he didn't come. He will keep quiet. This person, what about him? He said, no, he said, Munafi, he didn't come. So when they asked about, where's Abu Dhar? Where's Abu Dhar? Nobody could say anything. Later on, they now saw a sun at a distance. You know, like a sun coming at a distance. He said, this is Abu, Abu Dhar. He now said, Abu Dhar. Asha Wahida. Wal Mata Wahida. You live alone. You will die alone. And you resulted alone. His us became weak. His camel became weak. So he had to leave the camel and put all his loads at his back. <laughs> now, that is Abu Zal Gifari. Now, whenever I'm reading the story of Abu Gifari, we will be imagining who this person is, his determination, his rigidity. He's a rigid person. And if you look at the Hadith, the Hadith that he mentioned, Abu Dhar Gifari, when he said, my friend asked me to observe seven things. You will understand that the Prophet Islam, he knew Abu Dhar very well. Even though that Hadith also applies to all other Muslims, in the world, but particularly the Rasul Islam, he understand Abu Ghar, Abu Dhar very, very well. One of it, he says that, who, I'm not quoting very well, he said, who will miss him? You must love those who are poor. Love those who are poor. Among them, he says, don't look at those who are superior to you, look at those who are inferior to you. Among them, he says, Say the truth, no matter how bitter it is. And um, all those seven points became the personality description of Abu Dhar al Gifari. Now, exactly like I was saying. Now, called Amarani, Kupul Masakin. Now, well, Sheikh, my in the al. Love the poor people. It's seven points. Let me just. Amara need to put bill masakin. Now, what then no mean? What Amara need an answer in a man who are doing it? Now, when I answer in a man who are for me. Superior, don't look at superior people. Look at those who are inferior to you. What Amara need Allah as Allah a hadden shell. Don't ask anybody. Don't ask anybody. Don't become cap in hand, begging around. Yes, anybody. Don't do that. Now, Sheikh. What am I an asula rahim? He said that, Sheikh, uh, you must maintain family ties. Hmm. Now, 
wa amarani an aqul al haqq wa in kana murra say the truth no matter how bitter it is i'm sorry sir hold, hold on sir um my elder brother is here and uh, i must say this yes amir sir may that bless you sir you are a man of, you are a man of struggle amir <laughs> you are a man of action he asked her, I said, no, it's not, it's, I'm explaining this. That. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, it's okay. I, say I should go on. No. Don't fear anybody. Yes. On the part of Allah. Don't fear anybody. <laughs> Continue increasingly be saying, these are things that Allah that Islam said to him. Uh, it's not just, not just only for Buddhism, for all of us. On this last one, my brother Islam, these are tough. Oh. We're in a very difficult period. Oh. We're in an extremely difficult period. I came into Abuja young. I mean, just a few years ago, or oh, this is my 30 years in Abuja, things have never been like this before. Yes, things are difficult, extremely difficult to survive, to live. If you have food to eat in the morning, you have food to eat in the afternoon, in the night, well, like, you are very few among people. Yes, this is time we must also imbibe the wisdom. Islam gave Abu Dhar continuously be saying, La Hawla, Wala Kuwata, Ilam Lazim. Be saying it now. Anytime we face such difficulty, it's Kanz, Nalikunz Jannah. It's a treasure among the treasures of Jannah. Now, so those seven points describe the life of Abu Ghifari. Now, Abu Dhar Ghifari was a Malahu. Abu Dhar with the elites. In Medina, after the death of the Rasul, wealth came. Wealth came. And uh, Abu Raira, and those who are miskin in Makkah, in the masjid of Makkah, they became governor. Yes. Abu uh, Al um, Ashari became governor, became wealthy. So they had that in Medina, they came to him and they were very happy to see him. You know, those that you struggled together in the old days. Ah, yeah, Abu Ghar. They want to hug him, say, no, 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 don't, don't hug me, don't hug me, don't hug me. I heard that we're governor now. <laughs> no, but <laughs> take me. Yes. It's Abu Rera want to hug him. No, 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 no. Stay away, don't hug me. I heard that you're a governor now. You are extremely wealthy. You even uh, stand Allah. You redesign your accommodation. You? I said, no, 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 no. Don't. So these are the people. So now those who came, the Tabi'in, they love him. They love him so much. But for the governor, for the political class, though this man is a fitna in a in a community, you know. So they are always very careful with him. The last one, he said that now, now when he's gonna die, Abu Abu Zar al Mauti, when he was gonna die. So the wife was crying. Why are you crying in the desert? So why are you crying? He said, I'm crying because it's just me. I don't even have the daft or the clothes to wrap you. That's why I'm crying. He said, no, no, don't cry. The so, Sultan so says that one of you will die in the desert. His companion will be coming and they will bury him. He said, everybody in that sitting, they all died except me. So it means that it applies to me. So he died. He said, just, when I die, just put me, just put me down. So when the man died, when Abu Fad died, then um, 
there's caravan coming. In that caravan, there's uh, even Masood. We say, what is this? Who, what happened to my husband? Who's, who's the husband? Abu Ghal. Masood was, became side crying. Why is he crying? He said, what? This happened, sorry, what happened now? Rasulullah Islam, I've said years before. And now, to close it, like I said, they were institutions. You can imagine, we are discussing him now. Somebody who existed a thousand, sorry, mm. um, 1,455 years ago. Mm. Get it now. So this is how, now the best we could do, my brother Islam, is application. It's an application of what we have learned from them. No matter how well it is that we are, we are, we should just, we should not be like a Abuja a a person. We should be humble. No matter. Now, don't say your brother is poor, he doesn't have a car, you will not you will stay away. No, 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 don't do that. We are not people like that. Now, I learned something from Madam. I learned, yeah, I must say it now. Madam, a big man who is humble. I went to his house in area three. I saw his children, they were in the house. I said, what happened to your children? He said, I don't have money for school fees. They are in the house. I have to keep quiet. But look at this humility. You get it now. He didn't, all of them are graduates now. They're all graduates now. <laughs> he did not mind at all. I learned from that, yes. Poverty is not continuous. It's just a temporary thing. It will go. Now, and so on and so forth. Plus, I want to stop here. Whatever I've said that is wrong, may Allah forgive me. Whatever I've said that is good, may Allah make us understand it. Brothers, I'm saying it again, or I will repeat it again. We are in a difficult period, not just in Nigeria, all over the world. We continuously must be saying, La Haula. Takbir. Jazakumullah heron for the first two speakers. May Allah increase them in knowledge. May Allah make it easy for us to implement what we have learned today. Our viewer within and outside, may Allah continue to strengthen each and every one of us. We are going to take contribution. Then thereafter, we we'll take question and answer. Then uh, in between, we'll have an interlude because we are in Ward Hijab Day. We'll be calling on uh, Sister Feridausi Amasa to come and talk to us briefly on uh, you know, the activities surrounding Ward Hijab Day. The first person to take uh, you know, contribution is our chair of today, a doctor, a Sheikh Dr. Hussein Abdallah Rahman. We are going to time you, inshallah. You shouldn't exceed four minutes. So that uh, others can talk, inshallah. I'm the chairman yes. of uh, this. Yes. It's my role you are playing. So I allow you to play my role. You are helping me. So uh, what I want is a situation where the audience gives their contribution. I think I should be the last. Then from there, we now change into the hijab. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. For allowing others to speak first. We are going to call on our pioneer Amir. Uh, this is a brief remark. When, when we need his talk most, he has already started showing me sign. No, sorry, uh, Salaam alaikum. Actually, it's not a matter of being uh, shy. It's always good to be on this background so that I can also assimilate what people have been saying. But when you come and they dominate, you must talk, you must talk. I don't feel it is nice for. Uh, uh, environment. Having said that, maybe this is the last time I will make comment here. Yeah? I don't know. <laughs> uh, speaking about Abuzar is uh, enormous, and you can pick several lessons from his uh, relationship with the Prophet, with the okay. Sahaba. Sorry? That's my nature. I say about Abuzar, it's not exhaustive to discuss any Sahabi here within 30 minutes. And I believe whenever we pick one of the Sahabas, it's able to de derive one or two lessons from such a Sahaba. I think one of the lessons we'll have derived from Abu Zar is that uh, sincerity, commitment, and selfless service to Islam. And that was what earned him the status he had 
among the Sahabas. I will maybe appraise a sitting that Prophet ﷺ had with the Sahabas. And he posed a question. He asked Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he said, in this world, what do you love most in this world? Said Nabakar said, I love three things. I jealous Maaka, or Nazri Ileka, or in fact, or Laika. Said Nabakar said, I prefer in this world three things sitting in your midst, looking at you, and so spending for your sake. He asked now Usman and Umar, what did you love most in this world? He said, I love three things. Al Amr bin Maruf, Walau Kana Sirra. Wanai Anil Munkar, Walau Kana Jahara. Wakalu Maruf, Walau Kana Murra. I love three things. Guiding people to what is right, even if it is in confidence or quietly or in secret. And also, I would love to prevent any act of abomination or wrongdoing, even if it is going to be manifested, manifestly. And lastly, we prefer to speak the truth, no matter how bitter it is. So it proceeded, he asked Na Usman, what do you like, love most? He said he loved three things. It am to am, or if shall salam, was allowed to be lay or nursing the I prefer three things in this world, at least feeding the less privileged, those who are in need of food, and then spreading salam among my, command, my people, and then standing up in the night to observe salat while people are observing their night enjoyment or resting. I wanted to leave, I, want, I just want to proceed to Abu Zar. He asked Nal, what do you want in this world? He said, I love two th three things. And that is one, he loved fighting and fasting in terms of winter. And also he loved hitting the neck of an adu with his sword. And the last, the third one, I will remember. But coming to Abu Zar, he said, I love three things, and I think you'll be shocked. He said, I love Uhibbul Jaw'a Wa Uhibbul Marad Wa Uhibbul Maut Does it make sense? <laughs> eh? Explain, sir. <laughs> this question he asked paused even the Sahabas were rattled including the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He said, why? He said, I prefer hunger because it will soften my heart and mind. I prefer sickness because it will erase my sins. And I prefer mud because I want, it is, I want to meet my Lord. Now, this is when he said that everybody was really shocked. And the first seller has to come in his own characteristic way of trying to relieve the tension in people. He said, I love three things in this world. Oh, he put me in the of Salasa. A tip. Huh? When the sa? And the last one is what? A thin when the sa? What? Who can remember? What could I need for Salat? So when the tension was high from Abu Zar, Prophet Salah Salam came with this thing. Everybody is happy now. He said, I prefer perfume. Why is Zuluka and I with so many perfumes here? And he prefer ladies, women. And also he preferred, the, the comfort of his eyes is satisfied in his salat. Look at the two extremes. And also Jibril came back, came down. He said, he said salam to you. And he said, also he loved three things in this world. What is it that he wanted? He blagged the salah or Ada in Amana. Huh? And then he prefer and uh, last one I forgot also.
prefer to deliver the message and also the, the trust. Why I brought this, in every episode of the Sahabas you, you, you oppress, you always find Abu Zar becoming distant and unique in his approach. And this is what Islam is. We can always have blend of people among us. And each of us is supposed to be a mirror to another. So we can learn among us, I believe that so who are tending to an abuser, who don't like this world, among those are those who want this world, among those are those who want to marry wives, among those are those who, so many of these are in the Sahabas. But the lesson of today is the lesson of sacrifice, the lesson of commitment, and the lesson of dedication. And above all, the lesson of Abu Zahar today, I think is, uh, is timely. I'm not saying people should prefer hunger, but if it comes, if it comes, you have a, a, you have a, a blessing on it because it humbles you. During, during Ramadan, you know how we go humble. But in post hunger, bring more confusion, even hypertension. May Allah protect us from that. Sickness is bound to come. When it comes, look at the other side of sickness. By it, inshallah, your measurable sins, Allah will erase them from you. May Allah forgive us all our sins. And then we should try to be more focused. Everything about this world is time. Today, we are discussing Abu Zal. Maybe in some few years to come, somebody will be discovered one or two of us in his absence. So let us try to be upright. And may Allah forgive us our sins. So I'm all right. May Allah reward him most apparently. We are going to take an interlude from our sister, Sister Frida Zamasa, who is going to talk to us on what hijab, inshallah. Tafadal. No. No. Please, sister, just give me one minute. Okay. And hopefully, then, you have all heard from our distinguished lecturers and the former Amir. I think what I observe here is the exact teaching of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu No, avoiding extreme ends. Extreme ends. And always taking the meat core. Why not condemning that or the other one? Because all are going to be rewarded. But the best is the meat core. So that you can be able to appreciate your brother and encourage your brother. And look at when they deliver the lecture. When my Dan Masalin Abuja was talking about what the Prophet asked Abdul Zari Gifari, and he said that uh, he will fight. He said, Don't fight. If you also take a cue, you see, you will always have to give room to your brother. There is the possibility of making committing mistakes. If you don't do that, you can even overdo things and later you'll be regretting it. Mm. And that's the situation we find ourselves today is so harsh and terrible. All of, we are just sitting down before you know, we just discover ourselves in this. Because if we saw what people were saying about our leader, because there was a time it reached, I said, Kai, this man people are condemned. So you cried to Allah and he brought this man. Now all of us are condemned and abusing this man. If he's a friend of Allah, how are you going to do? Man adali waliyan fakod azan tumbel harp. Today, what, what can one say? Then come and see the ex, ex, excesses of our leaders. So please, my, my addition is from what we have heard from Amir and what the Prophet said. Because our women are created for us to enjoy. Marry one, two, three, four. The prophet did not stop it. And then look at other things that have made. If you distance yourself from it, what will become of the world? How will you worship Allah? What are we going to account for? These are the things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to achieve the very best on the right path. So now we turn over to our hijab day and then here a commendation for our sisters, especially your struggle to remain when you come out. Something that at least we can be proud of that these are the 
World Jazz Day has been marked on 1st of February, and it started by one Nazman Khan, who, was, who faced a um, challenge with hijab, who was harassed, and decided to pick a day to sensitize people on the use of hijab. And the following year, that is 2014, there has been a coalition of Muslim women in Nigeria, in Abuja here, which consists of Islamic organizations like Form One, Women in Dawa, Al Mu'minat, Mesh, um, and a few others in collaboration with some Islamic schools to sensitize people on the use of hijab. Today, we were at Fuad Nababidi School, that is an Islamic school at um, Wuse, where we did a press conference. We called different media houses, about 10 of them, where we addressed them and called them to please help us echo the word of the importance of the use of hijab. And we have other lined up programs um, today, tomorrow, next tomorrow, until Sunday. So tomorrow we will also be having some other, uh, we'll be visiting media houses and schools to sensitize the public on the importance of hijab. On Saturday, we have um, a, a program at the Millennium Park where we would, by 3 p.m., inshallah, we invite our sisters to please join us. There, there, are, there will be a lot of people, non-Muslims. We would also try to sensitize the public there. We try to introduce non-Muslims who have never, never had any interaction with hijabi to even try to use the hijab and see that it is just a clothing. We don't hide anything under the hijab, it's just a clothing, they can try it, and it is always a, a fun um, program because a lot of non-Muslims just see the hijab as something strange. They have never had interaction with people who use the hijab, and that informs the kind of apathy they have to eat. So this is just to sensitize the public. Also on Sunday, inshallah, here at the hall, we have a program, a public lecture that is coming up, inshallah. We hope that we will um, tell our sisters and our wives to please join us so that it will, um, the message would reach further, inshallah. So by 10 a.m. on Sunday, inshallah, we have a program all organized by the coalition, a group of Islamic organizations to spread the word or the message of um, hijab, although it's something that we have to do every day because as much as we continue to do the sensitization, the, the harassment is not stopping. Just this morning in my office as the Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, we received a report from UCA Chibadon, that's the University College um, Hospital, where a sister in an ECOB, she went to approach a four-day-old, she carried a four-day-old baby to the hospital and the baby was rejected just because the woman was wearing the cob. So I don't understand this pers perspective, but it is because of the hatred they have for, for Islam and the Muslims. So it is something that, is, that has to be continued. It is a continuous effort, and we seek the help of our fathers to please join us in spreading the message so that even if we cannot eliminate the the apathy that is done to hijab will reduce it to the barest minimum. So that's all I would like to share. I hope we'll all participate and support our programs, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan for the opportunity. We are going to go into question. Then we'll have to take numbers, inshallah, for those who have some questions, inshallah. We should indicate those who want to ask questions pertaining to the topic that have been treated today, inshallah. Let's take numbers. Any question? Sisters, any question? No question. Eh, okay, one. To, tafadal. Right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi uh, I am Hamdani Abdullahi Yusuf by name from Islamic Education Trust here in Abuja. Um, I want to say a big jazakumullah khairan to the presenter. Actually, we have learned a lot. And uh, from the ta'aliq given by Amir, also we benefited a lot. So I want to like put a request. <coughs> uh, the admonishment uh, given to Abu Dhar, which was uh, you know, read by uh, Malan Damasani, 
If we can please have the page snapped and shared in the group. I want to believe, uh, uh, you know, listening to this uh, very rich presentation, we all have a burden on our uh, head to disseminate or to take this information further. Maybe at our various places, the avenues we do have to mingle, to intermingle with others. Let us not just restrict this information or this knowledge to our own, uh, you know, selves, but rather try to extend it. So if we can have those admonishments, I want to believe they are very vital and uh, we need it, uh, you know, even the more in this, uh, you know, contemporary situation. We, you know, read it out, uh, give some little, you know, uh, additional explanation and see how we can integrate it into our daily, uh, daily life. Jazakumullah khairan to the organizers. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accord us with the ability of uh, implementing all that we have learned, emulate, and uh, uh, so that our life will be better, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Jazakumullah khairan. Your observation is noted. We are going to implement it, inshallah. We will share it at the AMF Shura platform, then AMF General platform, so that uh, people can get it and also circulate it, inshallah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my brother, you have may Allah increase you in guidance. You have mentioned what is very, very important: the hadith of Abu Dhar al Ghifari. There's one thing I observe. When he said, "Kul hakka walokana unro," so difficult, bitter it is. Truths are always difficult and bitter. Now, and then when you observe, when it goes run, runs through life, people do not necessarily tell you the plain truth. They don't. Until you have an enemy who will now tell you what the truth is. But you know what happened? You need to listen to those who tell you the stark truth for you to improve in life. For instance, you talk too much, or you lie too much. You something now will not believe it now, or you backbite too much. Yes, we don't often hear things like that from the brothers. You don't, but the person who is doing it, he will not know he has blemishes until somebody will tell him the stark truth. Yes, may I bless Abu Mazida. We were in a lecture and I was talking with emotions. So when he was going to respond, I said, Brother Bazak, emotion is not knowledge, it's not knowledge. Emotion is not knowledge. Just displaying emotion is not knowledge. I have never had that before. Yes, I went back home. After two years, I went to Sudan to learn. Yeah, I have just been emotional. No, 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 no. That is a part. Knowledge isn't the same thing as emotion. You have to go and study it from people. I just speak that one. So I'm just saying, like Abu Dhar, let us always express the truth. It is not always sweet, you know, but you just have to say it for society to be improved. May I assist us? I have a question. My question goes to us, how do you reconcile uh, truthfulness and uh, diplomacy? Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Actually, the truth is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. One of the seven advice or command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Amarani an akula haq walawkana murra The Prophet ordered me, directed me to say the truth however bitter it is. Yes, I agree with you. Protect yourself against harm. Protect yourself against death even. Forceful death. But as my friend used to say, there is nothing like white lies. Don't cover 
the truth with lies just because we survive. Abu Dhar never feared death. He welcomes death. Of course, we may find it difficult to get Abu Dhar nowadays, but Mara'a minkum munkaran fali yugayirhu biyadi wa illam tastadi fabilisanihi wa illam tastadi fabiqalbihi wa dhalika abafu iman So there are three stages of saying the truth, believing in the truth, and maintaining the truth. Where it is apparent you can control, fight for the truth. Where you cannot, you don't have power, say the truth. And where the two are almost impossible, hate the lies and believe in the truth with your heart. And that is the weakest. Anything below that, subhanallah, no more iman. May Allah guide us. Yeah. What I just want to add was uh, when, you know, when uh, Allah sent... Prophet Musa to Firauna, he said, Wakurullahu kaulan layinan. Because, you know, all of us have suffered from this. When we're young, we think that it is boldness. We don't know, you know, when you are talking to elders, some people, even not elders, the way you address the matter sometimes will make, bring unnecessary reaction. So there is need, especially with brothers. We, when we're younger, we suffered this thing. <laughs> like, some of, like some of the admonition I'll do today, I'll do today, and it will not raise us. If it was before, you know, I think this <laughs> <laughs> the We ask the Amir to make a, a brief remark. Then before we go to the chairman of the day to also wrap it up, inshallah, before we break for uh, Maghrib, then we'll come for Iftar proper, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, I mean, may Allah continue to bless the speakers on behalf of all the listeners, I say Jazakum like Kiran to you all, and uh, thanks for coming. Particularly the Mujahidun, <laughs> he knows himself. Abdul <laughs> Razak, thanks for coming. The chairman, I will not greet the dance Masani. He's, he's just uh, it's compulsory on him to come. Um, please let our watch world be quality. It's um, very insulting that. Um, a sister will go to a teaching hospital that belongs to the federal government and she'll be rejected because of wearing a cup. Why? Because from up to down, we are not there. We are not represented. If it is in Abuja now, look at the Bola boys. Yes, we are many in quantity. The Bola boys, is she, are there the people to go and speak at the teaching hospital in Abuja here? They are not. As we are teaching our children quality Islamic education, let us ensure that they aspire to be the best in their field. I am sure that if the medical director at the UCH is a Muslim, that would not probably have happened. Yes, Aljana, Aljana, let us take the one that belongs to us in this world. So our mothers, our fathers, please, our children, if it's not too late for us, Particularly, particularly our children, if we don't want them to become second-class citizens in this country, we must ensure that they go for quality education and aspire to be the best in their field. Salam alaikum wa wa barakatuh. Thank you, Amir. Uh, I am grateful to God because I didn't know that I chaired the last meet, uh, iftar session and today I will do the same. Uh, something, you know, came to my mind because uh, the elder statement today where the younger generation of the Duat of uh, Abuja Muslim Forum, so very many of us now are elder statesmen, so to say. But I'm keen to observe that who are those that are like us over 30 years ago that I'm seeing here. So if we started this that time, and the same is gathering us together, whom are we handing over to? So I'm curious about it, what is happening to our children? So there's something that ought to be done on that. I have another suggestion. If this were uh, to be a conference, we will have a community developing body. So like, 
the lesson of the last iftar about 30 rights of your Muslim brother and sister. It's not something to throw away. If we have a kind of a body there that when iftar is going there, they are picking something, develop it into a kind of a community from Abuja Muslim Forum that just as that brother said, it will be into social media. We, throughout the week, we, uh, uh, Ustaz Yunus press uh, is, director is there, and many other things that we can do. Because I've always been imagining that we have gone through this over the years. What are the results? What is, uh, I mean, what have we, you know, what can we target as, as, as the constraints of what we have done? So I will be questioning myself. At times, you will not even see me. What am I? Let me go and do something, and then from somewhere I'll say, Abuja Muslim, we have lost this, let's do this. We have lost that, not to come up. But I now see that our coming and, you know, regenerating the ideas again, we had many years, is very helpful. And we take us somewhere. Especially those of who are old, who have retired, who have, it's very, very good that we'll be coming. So this is it, my brothers. We have a lot to do. We have a lot to give support. And there's one crucial something that Amir touched. When he was talking about the quality of our children, there's another thing. That is why when Engineer Zorkanein, Mujahidul Zaman, was talking from where uh, 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 the Secretary General Jam Masani ended, he now brought the diplomatic aspect. Kaulan eh? Leyinan is another message. You don't just talk anyhow. Assess where you are going. To bring out result is the best. But when you go somewhere and you scatter the place, then they are just these brothers, they are extreme, they are so-so and so, you are not helping Islam. These are the crucial things. I think that you know, from the principle of the old to principle of the digital era we are in, we should have also something. I don't know. Brother Yunus, you get what I'm saying. So that even those who are not here, they will be getting it. You see, the Amir of El, El, El is, is uh, the eldest, the most, the uh, most eldest uh, statesman. He's always here. But I want to see uh, the generation of our children that, they, that tomorrow they will bring up the Abuja Muslim Forum as that umbrella organization. Then they will forge ahead as we did. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist us. Thank you very much. This man. There is a brother who said he has some uh, you know, little uh, remark on the issue of hijab after when Amir was talking. We'll just give you one minute or two minutes to make your talk before we go into closing prayer. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Amir Ujunaidu. I work with AMAC. Uh, the issue of hijab, I wanted to ask the sister that just spoke about it. What have we been doing about the issue of our Muslim coffers, Muslim and the Muslim uh, women? Like the nature of their dress, sometimes they were even intimidated in the office and other. Even if they cover their uniform, NYSC uniform with hijab, they will be subjected to remove it and other things. So please, I want to know if some action is following up on the issues. Uh, people who are related to MCAN here and the rest, Risha Koladele is here. So if you can uh, react to what he has uh, just mentioned, inshallah. Salam alaikum. My name is Remina Risha Koladele. Uh, the question asked by the last speaker on the issue of hijab vis a vis the uniform of air should be, you know, Arras anymore years after that incident. You see, let me assure you, it's a reoccurrence decima. It happened almost every service year. And MCAN on our part, from Simcoe Pass Affairs, by the way, we've gingered all the state Amir right from the national headquarters. They know what to do. Even though some of them are even Muslim and they know even the importance of hijab, but they will want to see you and say, look, you must cooperate. Is it not just for a week? Is it not just for two weeks? So we have mobilized our sister not to agree. And many a time in some camp, the worst is that they will say, okay, sister, I remain in the mosque. Don't come out and participate. If I let me be sincere to you, this day we ginger some of our sister that right from day one, when you have finished your documentation, ask for 
exceptionality. My daughter is part of the show, all right? They allow them to go their way. Then after a day or two to the person now, you come back and collect your documentation and then, you know, you, you, you resume at your place of primary assignment. It's not a must that you must jog up and run up and down, all right? There are even so many better ways of doing exercise indoor that you even be more, more fit. So that issue does not have a permanent solution for now, but at the same time, it's an issue that doesn't disturb us anymore because we have devised our own way of getting over it whenever it's happened in any camp nationwide. Assalamu alaikum. Time, time is not of essence. Maghrib now is uh, is uh, six thirty. Uh, so there are some of these issues we can come back when we come back for iftar. We will address them. The sister, do you have anything to add to what Isha Kaladeli have said? Eh? Eh, in on NYC issue after after Maghrib, inshallah, we are going to do our adjoining uh, dua. Inshallah, we are going to call on. Uh, Oh, announcement, really. <laughs> you can see. It's a very important announcement. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. On Sunday, the Amir will lead us by 12 noon to a community, Wasa community, after Akpol Mechanic Village. Wasa community had an intervention project of a mosque, a clinic, and an Islamia school. The Qatari government built it for them, and they went around all over Abuja and discovered that it's only Abuja Muslim Forum that is non-sectarian, non-political, and at the middle of a course. They profiled Abuja Muslim Forum and discovered that we are the only ones that we don't belong to one sect or the other. We accommodate everybody. So they came and met us and said they want to be part of Abuja Muslim Forum. And we should know them and they should know us. So the Amir has directed we should meet them on Sunday. We will take off from here at 12 noon to Wasa community, less than 30 minutes, inshallah. Please, if you will be part of that history, indicate in any of the Abuja Muslim platforms or contact Yunus Salahuddin. We are taking off from here at 12 noon. Logistics will be provided by the ESCO, inshallah, but indicate how many. There is a brother that I want to talk about. Uh, oh, you have, okay, after Maghrib, inshallah. So please indicate so that we plan how many of us are going, both brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please let's endeavor to come back after Maghrib. There's also another announcement that I have to do with issue of health that uh, a brother have uh, you know, want to share with us coming up February 11th. So please, let's endeavor to come. I will call on uh, Haji Mala Mustafa to give us a journey to inshallah. Alhamdulillah <laughs> Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair.